Merry Christmas Eve, guys. Merry Christmas. Yeah. What's the hook? Wait, I thought. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Let's give some love to our uh, our bride yesterday. You're in the back. And our groom yesterday. Yeah. Oh. Give some love, Andrew and Thea. Woo. Man. Yeah. <laughs> that was a good. That was a good party last night. That was fun. We had a good time. All right. Uh, hey, um, we are, we are, you know, it's Christmas Eve. It feels kind of weird. It doesn't feel like Christmas Eve, right? Do you guys feel like Christmas Eve? It's not a Sunday. It's, it feels kind of awkward to me, but, you know, it's Christmas Eve. You know, I'm, I'm glad we are here together to worship the Lord. I want to uh, continue our, our, our series that we're in. We're going to come today to, you know, really ask the question about Christmas. You know, we're going to, you know, how, how does Christmas, how did Jesus come in Christmas? And so let me give you a quick review of what we've been talking about this past month, Okay. This past month, we've talked about first how how Christmas is this picture, if you understand it, of how God orchestrated the nations and time, how he spanned generations, how he moved tyrants and kings, how he worked systems into ultimately bringing about his son, Jesus Christ. How even though the people were living in darkness, waiting for a sign of hope and life, they couldn't see how it's going to happen. But yet in the whole background, in the midst of all that hopelessness, in the background, God's story was that he was orchestrating it for us, for, for the coming of his son. And that, that gives us an idea of what God is willing to go through in preparing the journey, the way, and the, the picture of our lives. You know, so even in the journey of our personal lives, wherever darkness, wherever place you find yourself at, the story of Christmas tells us one thing. You know what that is? The guy's in the background still. He's still orchestrating the story. He's still writing it. He's back there. It took God 4,000 years, moving people, nations, tyrants, and kings all over the place to bring about his son for the perfect time. And in the same way, your story written, however it may be right now, whatever season you may be in, God is still in the background orchestrating and writing your story. Right? And, we, and we talked about this picture of how the king is here. Jesus is here. The king is here. But the kingdom is not here yet. See, the king is here. So that tells us what? That tells us there is hope to come. That the way things are going to be is not how it's meant to be because the king has come. But the fact that the kingdom is not here it tells us one thing. We don't have to pretend. You don't have to pretend like everything is perfect. You can be honest in your suffering. Right? I told the kids, you know, in the youth group, you know, for, for you guys, most of the things you guys pretend about is trying to pretend like you're good kids at church, right? You don't have to pretend because the kingdom is not here, right? For you guys, you guys don't have to pretend like your life is put together. We all know your life is not put together. No matter how much staff chat you tell us that your life is beautiful, your life is not put together. We know that. But we, te- we have this kind of like natural tendency to try to fool everybody like our lives are put together. See, when the kingdom is not here, it tells us we can be honest of how things are really going to be, how things are really are right now in your life. But the king is here, so you know what? There's hope that it's not going to be like this forever, right? And last week we talked about what did the king come to bring? What was it? You guys remember? Tell me you guys remember. Come on, please. Joy, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Who just showed up, right? Joy, right? Joy. Joy is created in giving. Thank you. Joy is created in giving. That, 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 that the king has come not to bring personal happiness because personal happiness is fleeting. He's come to bring joy. He's come to bring a steady joy into our lives. And joy is created in the ability to give, Right? Today, I want to share with you guys this one. How did he come? How did Jesus come? How did he choose to come to this earth? And why did he do that? How did he come here, and why did he do it that way? Okay? So let's, uh, let's go back to 2 Samuel. Okay? Second Samuel. We have a lot of verses to go through today. If you guys can't keep up with the Bible flipping, it's all right. It's going to be up on the, on the screen for you guys. But, you know, if you guys want to practice how fast you guys can find a book, you know, this is the day. This is the day, all right? You're going to have some Bible practice. Second Samuel. Second Samuel and a lot of the Old Testament is kind of like the hype man. 
you know when you when you when you're about to like you know get into like a battle like a dance battle or whatever you need a hype man or someone to come in and kind of hype it up for you right a lot of the old testament is just full of hype because they're hyping something up they're hyping up this picture of a king who's coming who's gonna just like you know bring it when he comes right so the story of second Samuel we're gonna read in psalm is we're gonna see this picture of just this this is constant hype. Hey, God, you promise. You promise when this guy comes, the kingdom's going to last forever. You promise that when it comes, it's going to be awesome. You, you promise that it will be an everlasting kingdom. We cannot wait for this guy to come, right? 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, I got to find it too. 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verses 8 through 13. You have the list, right, Stephen, back there? All right, I, I wrote a huge list of things. They're, they're going to be mad. All right, anyways, 2 Samuel 8 to 13. Check it out. This is God speaking here. Second Samuel chapter, I'm sorry, chapter, chapter 7, verses 8 to 13. Chapter 7, verses 8 to 13. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be a ruler over my people Israel. He says, tell David, remember, you were a shepherd, you were a nobody, and I made you king. Verse 9, I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies and be from before you. Now I will make your name great like the names of the greatest men on, of the earth. Right? I have always been with you. Now you will see the legacy. Verse 10, and I will provide a place for my people, Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning. And have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. And when your days are over, you will rest with your fathers. I will raise up your offsprings to succeed you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will establish, if you know the history of it, the dude that came after King David was King Solomon. The guy had a hundred wives or a thousand wives. Game over, okay? Kingdom was messed up. It didn't last forever at that point. But here's the promise. Here's the hype. God told David, somebody's coming from your line, from your blood. Somebody's going to come, and I will establish that kingdom forever. And so the people who are going back and they're listening to this and they're, they're reading and they're, they're like, dude, he's, who is he? I cannot wait. He's going to come, and it's going to be awesome. He's going to come, and he's going to reign, and he's going to bring our people to a state of peace. This guy is going to be amazing. Let's go to Psalm chapter 89. Again, it's all hype. We're hyping it up. You know, all these Old Testament writers, they're hyping up what's coming, who this person's going to be, how crazy he's going to be, right? Psalm 89, verses 1 through 4. And this is what he says, Psalm 89. And I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you establish your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, this is what God, this is what he's saying. You said, God, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. So this is how the picture of God's people were thinking. They were thinking, man, this is the promise God has given to our people. This is the promise that God has given to our line. This is the promise that God has given to David. We cannot wait to see who this king will come to be. He must be glorious. He's, he must come and on. He must be this amazing guy. We cannot wait. And they're hyping it up. And the Old Testament is just waiting for it. And they're hoping for it. And they're wishing for it. And they're like, yes, it's coming. It's going to come. And then we see Christmas. How did Jesus, God, choose to come? How did he choose to come? And then we're going to ask the question, why? How did God actually come? This was the expectation. How did he actually come? And we're going to see why, okay? Check it out. Go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. You guys doing all right? Everyone feeling good after the party? Sleep well? Yeah? All right. Matthew 1. I kind of just woke up and came here. It's, it's really just what happened for me. <laughs> Put on a pair of jeans, that's probably it, right? <laughs> verse 18, verse 18, chapter 1, verse 18. 
I'm just trying to buy time for you guys to find your verses, guys. All right, love me, right? Chapter 1, verse 18. And this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Okay, so check this out. Verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So I know you guys think, like, okay, that's kind of crazy. That's kind of scandalous. But let me tell you how scandalous it is. Okay, do you know how, how old Mary is when she uh, was uh, Holy Spirit and doc- uh, pregnant, pregnant uh, you know, whatever, <laughs> when she was pregnant with, by the Holy Spirit? She was around Alicia's age. You guys know Alicia, right? 12 or 13, okay? 12 or 13. When you get betrothed back then, you get betrothed pretty early. You, you don't get married back then. You get betrothed. means you're promised. And then when the season passes by, then you get married, okay? So they're not like sleeping with 12-year-olds, okay? So it's nothing like that, okay? But anyways, but imagine, imagine a 13-year-old showing up pregnant. Imagine Alicia, like, shows up pregnant. Can you imagine the scandal? Can you imagine the scandal? I don't know why I use Alicia. She's the only name I can think of right now, right? <laughs> right? right? Can you imagine the scandal? That will happen. You imagine all the words, all people will be questioning, like, what is going on? What is happening? What can you imagine all of that like going through our church, just our community itself? It would just be crazy, right? And then Joseph, Joseph, he understood biology, so he realized, um, how'd you get pregnant? Right? <laughs> right? And so he he decided to himself, you know what? I'm gonna I'm going to do it quietly because back then if you get betrothed and, you know, your spouse or this, uh, this betrothed person ends up getting pregnant, you can make a big deal about it. You can make a public affair. You can make her become this, the shame and the, um, the, the scandal of the whole entire town. But Joseph was a righteous guy, so he wanted to keep it as low-key as possible. I mean, he, didn't, he, may, he might have been hurt, obviously, but he's like, you know what? I don't want her to get, you know, killed or anything like that, so let's, let's just keep it low-key. So he's trying to just divorce her quietly. That was, that was, that was his plan. That was his picture, right? And how crazy is that? Is that this is how God chose, this is how Jesus chose to enter into this world, okay? Out of all the crazy ways you could have done it, he chose to enter the world through drama, okay? He didn't choose to enter the world through, like, you know, things being great. He chose to use a scandal to enter into the world, right? Those of you guys who love drama, right, you should love Jesus, right? It's just, it just happened because Jesus is the king of drama. He made, he made, he made his mother's life miserable, right? He chose to enter in such a way where she, he knew she would be the scandal of the town, okay? But look at verse 20. It says, this is what happens. It says, but after he had considered the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said to the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. How did God choose to be with us? The first thing he chose, the first route, the first journey, the first path he chose was scandal. He chose to come in a scandalous fashion. Right? I mean, if you had a choice to come, I mean, we don't have a choice of who, we, who our parents are, but if you had a choice to come, you know you probably wouldn't choose, you know, your family's life. You probably choose, like, you know, something a little bit higher up there, something less scandalous, right? Something a little bit easier, something in the, r- in the realm of, like, Bill Gates and, you know, like, really ex- rich people. You know, like, you would choose an easy route. You wouldn't choose scandal. But that's how he chose to come, right? So, so, he was so scandalous that the whole, I mean, imagine this. This was his stigma for the majority of his life, okay? The people in the town, you know, they whispered. Maybe they didn't, they didn't like outright kind of call Mary out, but they whispered it. They knew it, right? This is how you know. Look at Matthew chapter 13. Let me build some context for you. Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 to 55. Matthew 13. You know, back then, you were always associated with your father. It's a patriarchal so- society. So if you had a, f- if you were whoever, you were basically that person's son. You never m- mentioned the mother's name. You know why? Not because she wasn't great, but because it's a patriarchal society. You always, you are your father's son, okay? So check out what the, the, the people in the, in the town did for Jesus when he came back to preach for them. Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 to 55. So coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue. And they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked. 
isn't this the carpenter's son? They even mentioned Joseph's name. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother named Mary? And are his brothers James, Joseph's son, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Go to verse 56 too. Aren't all his sisters with us? When did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. Right? They were offended by him. And they used whose name? Mary's name. You know why they used Mary's name? Because his father, they were still questioning who the real father is. They're like, hey, I know, I know you, Jesus, right? When you, I know when your mom had you. That was scandal of the town, right? And so now at this time, he comes in, he starts preaching, he starts saying all these stuff, and they're like, do I know this kid? This is Mary's kid. This is Mary's kid. Oh, that kid, that kid, right? His whole life, he had this scandal following him. He had this, he had this stigma following him. And it wasn't just the people of the town. It was his family members too. Look at verse uh, John chapter 7. His siblings couldn't even believe what he was doing. Can you imagine? Let me ask you a question. What if you, one of your siblings, if you have siblings, came to you and told you, I'm the savior of the world? <laughs> what would you say to them? Right? <laughs> what would you, what would you, seriously, what would you say? If one of your siblings came to you and said, hey, <laughs> I'm the savior, right? right? Can, you imagine, can you imagine Lam saying that to Elon, right? Hey, Elon. I'm the Savior. <laughs> Worship me. How would Elon respond? It would not be okay. <laughs> it would be you're dead, Elon. <laughs> right? Look at verse 3 to 5. Look at verse 3 to 5. John chapter 7, verses 3 to 5. Jesus' brother said to him, You ought to leave here and go to Judea. Right? This is not like them like, you know, encouraging him. This they're just mocking him now. So that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one wants to become a public figure, acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. In other words, this is what the brothers were, were, were saying. Hey, why, why are you here? If, you, if you're really legit, go to, the, go to the city. Go to the big towns. Go to where everyone can see you. You're, doing it, you're coming here and saying all this crazy stuff just because this town, this very town thinks you're crazy. Right, you saying this is not going to do anything. I dare you. I dare you. Go to the big city and tell them everyone you're the savior. Right? Go. It's kind of like, like your sibling coming to you and saying, hey, I'm going to save you. Tell, tell all your parents. And you're like, you know what? If you really have the coldness to say that, let me put you on Facebook. Right? Go ahead. I'll, I'll live feed you right now. Go and tell the world that you're the savior. I dare you. Think how, imagine how, much, how crazy people will think you are. What were his siblings doing? They were taunting him. They were like, bro- big brother. I mean, I don't even know if you're our, our actual, like, you know, you're probably half our brother. I don't know, right? But seriously, if you are going to say all that, go to the big city. I dare you. I dare you. And that's the picture. This is part of the picture of how, how God chose to enter this world. He chose to use scandal, knowing that that scandal is going to follow him for the majority of his life. And on top of that, knowing that his siblings aren't even going to take him seriously. He chose to be taunted. That's how he chose to be in this world. How else did he choose to become in this world, okay? Matthew 4. Matthew 4. One through two. So the whole thing, um, the angel Gabriel says, God will be with, he will God, his name will be Emmanuel, God with us. So him being with us, what does that look like? Scandal. Offensive taunts okay verses one through two chapter four and jesus said and then jesus was led by the spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil and after fasting 40 days and 40 nights he was hungry he came what hungry he came thirsty he came and he was tempted he came in the flesh means what he knows what it feels like to actually feel hungry he knows what it feels like to be thirsty he knows what it feels like to have temptation He's coming in flesh. He's coming not like some Superman, glorious, king, powerful. He's not coming with some sort of superpower along with him. He came as a normal human being, willing to endure scandal, willing to be taunted, willing to offend people, willing to be hungry, thirsty, and endure temptation. How else did he come? Look at verse Matthew chapter 20, uh, 26, right? 26, we're going to keep going. Matthew 26. 
And he says, I'm going to build all this up. I promise you the, the payout is going gonna, gonna to be worth it. But you just got to stick with me, okay? Matthew 26. Because you got to see the words yourself. I can't just say I mean, I can, but it won't be, you know, the same power. Matthew 26, verses 14 to 16. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I hand them over to you? And so they counted out for him 30 silver coins. And from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand them over. Here it is. One of his 12 brothers, one of the guys who walked with him for three years, his apparently so-called, you know, quote-unquote, ride and die. One of his 12 said to the, you know, to the, to, to the Pharisees, hey, how much would it cost me? How much would you give me if I dime him out? How much would you give me if I give him to you? Right? How did he choose to come? He chose to be betrayed. He knew what betrayal feels like. Can you, ima- can you imagine that? Can you imagine someone that's really close to you, right? Someone that's like by your side, that's been walking with you, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, did a switch on you and betrays you, calls you out, dimes you out, right? Leaves you hanging, leaves you exposed like that. I'm pretty sure a lot of us kind of felt that way before in some one part or another. We've been betrayed by somebody we really loved. All right? That feeling of it. And Jesus was betrayed. Well, how else was Jesus? Little, go to verse uh, 33. Same chapter. Matthew 26, verse 33. And then Peter replied, Even if all fell away on account of you, I never will. And then verse 34, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered this very night before the rooster crows, you will, be, you will disown me three times. This is Peter. You know, out of the 12 disciples, there's ranking of disciples. I know that it sounds kind of weird, but there's grouping of disciples, right? There's the top three, okay? Peter, James, and Andrew. Those are the, uh, James and John. Those are the main boys. Those are like, you know, his closest circle. Those are the ones that God, knew, uh, Jesus knew that they were going to make the biggest difference. And then there were the bottom three. That's where Judas was at, you know. But, you know, it's okay. God was kind of, he's faithful to everybody. Everyone has grace in his life. He's going to move everyone towards uh, more of him. But those three were his boys. They're like, we're this close. There's no way. There is no way you will back me on this. What did Peter say? Yeah, I got you, Jesus. No, if everybody else, if all 11 of these fools dime you out, I still got you, right? And then what did Jesus say? Tonight. You're going to deny me three times. And can you imagine when Jesus was being beaten by the Sanhedrin in the court, and, there's, and, and Peter was outside the courtyard looking in, seeing what's happening to his, to his brother Jesus, and then some little girl comes up and says, hey, aren't you with him? And as Jesus felt, I mean, have you seen the scene in the movie Passion of the Christ? It's one of those most epic scenes. Like, Peter says, I don't know him. And then he looks, right, and he sees Jesus staring right at him. And you're like, I don't know him, right? To be denied by your closest, to be denied by the ones whom you call brother, all right? Jesus was betrayed. He was denied. Verse uh, uh, verse 36, same chapter. And Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there. He took Peter, the two sons of Zebedee, along, the, the, the three closest ones, right, with them. And he began to be sorrow and troubled, right? Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch over me. You know, can you imagine some brother come up to you and say, hey, you know, look, I'm so sad, guys. I'm broken. Just be with me. Just be here with me. Can you be here for me? I'm, I'm sad to the point where it's, it's, it's breaking my very soul. I re- the feeling of it is like death itself. Can you be here with me? If you're a normal human being, you'll say, what? Of course, I got you. Man, just be sorrow. I got you. I'll, I'll be right here. Okay? And then what happens? Look at verse 40. And then he returned to his disciples and found them. What were you doing? Sleeping, right? They drank too much that night, right? Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter? Can you not just watch me for one hour? I just told you I'm s- freaking sad. I just told you I feel like dying right now. All I ask is one hour. And they found them sleeping, abandoned, right? Agony of being alone. Go to 59 and 60. Then, you know, Judas comes, arrests him, brings him f- uh, before the Sanhedrin, which is the court, 
verse 59 and 60. Hang in there, okay? I know, like, whoa, what's going on, all right? Payout is coming soon, right now. 59 verse 60. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could be put him to death, but they did not find anything, though many false witnesses came forward, all right? He was placed in front of court, and they were trying to accuse him of doing something. They brought false people to accuse him of doing wrong. He was tried. He was tried for wrongly. Have you ever tri- Have you ever been wrongly accused of something? Right. Let me tell you a story. It's, uh, the other day, my wife. Right. All right. She's here. So anyway, the other day, my wife had a fender bender. She had a fender bender real fast. Right. Real quick. She was on the freeway, and some some person was on the car, and they basically stopped the car and then rolled backwards. It rolled backwards. She was in the middle of the freeway. Was, they rolled backwards, and she was like stopping, and it, and, and they because they rolled backwards, it hit her. You know. A little bit. It wasn't that bad. But anyways, they got the, the lady got out and was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I, didn't, I don't know what happened to my car. I just stopped and then rolled backwards. And, you know, I'm really, I, I apologize, right? My wife was like, all right, okay, cool. It's okay, no problem, right? And all these, it's like freeways and cars are just driving left and right. And Trisha, I don't know what Trisha was thinking. She's like, I'll just stay here. You know, I won't drive outside because, you know, if I drive out, the car behind us might come and boom, hits her. You know, so I'll just I'll stay here. Everything will be okay. Which is, okay, no, not very... It's, it's all right. It was very nice, but it was not very smart, right? But it was like, I was like, all right. And so she called the cops, and cops come, stops traffic, shh, okay? Cop comes, talks to the lady, comes back, and tells Trisha, well, she told me, sh- she told me she, you hit her, right? And Trisha was like, what? No, <laughs> right? I'm saving her life by being here. What is wrong with her, right? And then she was, you know, my wife, pregnant, starts crying, blah, 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 blah. And the cop was like, oh, my God, what's wrong, blah, blah, right? And, you know, he says, goes back and says, you tell her right now. I don't care. I don't, I'm not going to press charges or anything. I'm not going to write any report, but you go tell her that this is the story, right? And I want, before I leave, that this will be the, I do not want to be wrongly accused, right? And so she walk, he walks up to the lady and just blah, 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 talks for a little bit, comes back and says, well, I think she just changed the story because, you know, Trisha was saying, I'm not going to press any, you know, charges or you know make anything so she just changed the story all of a sudden you know and so she's like what did she say it's her fault no I was like well no then right I'm not leaving until someone agrees it's not my fault right it's not my I need someone to tell me it's not my fault you know and the couple's like, okay what do you want me to do you want me to write it up you want me to, like I can write it up we can do a whole thing she says no it's like not much of a damage but blah, blah, we can let it go but but you know it's that feeling of being accused right when you, when you were trying not to do anything wrong, but you being accused of doing something wrong. That's like very deep, personal, painful feeling. Right? When someone calls you out for something you didn't do. Right? And try to make it your fault. And so this is Jesus here. He's sitting here, and he's being accused of this for something he didn't even do. They couldn't find anyone. Go look at verse 65 to 68. Okay? So after they, they basically, after all that, you know, try to say, look, tell us, are you the Savior? Just tell me. Right? And you know what Jesus says? He says something even crazier. He says, before Abraham, not only am I the Savior, I am God. Right? He says, before Abraham, I am. Right? He, so he's not saying, I'm not just the Savior, bro. Right? I am God himself. And then the, the Pharisee was like, what? And he rips open the, I can't believe you just said that. Like, how dare you call yourself God? Rips open the shirt. Right? And then this is where he says in verse 65. He says, then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has spoken blasphemy. How dare he thinks he's a God? Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And everyone said, he is worthy of death, they answered. And then they spit on his face. They struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? So then what, are they, what are they doing? He says, he should die. For what? But what has he done wrong? So they came out and they started slapping him. Can you imagine just come up and just being slapped, boom, by a bunch of you know, old men slap and then spit on when you're down and start kicking you? And then once you're down, you know what they say? He's like, so who hit you? Right? Prophesy, right? Who hit you? Right? You're the Christ. Go ahead. Figure it out. Who hit you? Right? Mocking him while he's being beaten. Right? He was hit. He was slapped. He was spit on. He was mocked. Chapter 27. Verses 27 to 31. And so they brought him to the governor's house, and the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered a whole com- company of soldiers around him. They stripped him naked and put a scarlet robe on him, and they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. Then they spit on him, and they took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. Right? So here it is. It's a crown, 
all these thorns. They took the staff and they hit him on the head. Boom. Have you ever been hit by the feather duster growing up as a kid? Right? Yeah, you feel me? And that's just one little, little stick. That's just like on your hand if you're bad, right? on, your, on your calves if you're wrong, on your butt if your parents don't want to see any evidence to, to show your teachers. Right? It's one of those things where right? you know, it's just, just hide it. But Jesus got hit by a staff on his head repeatedly with a crown of thorns piercing through his skull. And after they had mocked him, verse 31, they took off the robe, put his cl- own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. How did Jesus choose to enter this world? Did he come in glory? This is, how did he choose to show himself to this world? He chose to come in the middle of a scandal, to be taunted the majority of his life, to be mocked by his brothers, to be tempted, to be hungry, to be thirsty, to be scorned, to be called a blasphemer, to be rejected, to be sorrowful, to be arrested, betrayed, spit, laughed at, mocked at, beaten, lied, convicted, condemned, pierced, banished, hated, left in rubble, ultimately crucified. This is how he chose to come. Their whole entire people waiting for a king, waiting for their God to come. And how did he choose to come? He chose to come like this. He chose to come like this. And the question you have to ask is what? Why? Because if you're, you know, thinking about it, you're thinking this is the most inefficient way to come, isn't it? You're thinking this is the most, if I just wanted to come and save the world, this is what I'll do. I'll just show up. I say, look, guys, I'm here. Here's the cross. I got you. Don't worry. I'm going to just get on it. Boom. Boom. World saved. You're welcome. That's it. That is the most efficient way to do it. Is it not? Why would you come in a poor family knowing that you will be mocked for the majority of your life, knowing that your mother will be looked upon badly for the rest of your life, being scorned by your siblings, being tempted, hungry, thirsty, being beaten, being lied, being wrongfully accused, being spit upon, being sorrowed, being abandoned, being betrayed, being denied? and ultimately being crucified, why would you come like that? Why? And the answer, or part of the answer is in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2. Turn in there. I know you need to know why, because you're thinking, that's, you're right, Tony. That's inefficient. That is so inefficient. I mean, if you had to choose to come, if you're God, right, you would, you would think you would, be a little bit smarter about how he came, would you not, right? You would choose a smart way. You would choose the easy way. You would choose the less painful way. Why did Jesus choose this way? Hebrews chapter 2, 17 to 18. Check it out. All right, I'm going to wait for you guys because I know you guys are waiting for the answer. Just flip. Keep flipping. Keep flipping. Okay. It's very climatic right now. It won't be anticlimactic, I promise. Here we go. 17. For this reason, he had to be made like his brother's flesh in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. He did what he did. He came this way. Why? To let you know. One thing, I understand. I get it. Me too. You know, the majority of fights in this world, the majority of conflicts is because one side does not understand the other. You may understand it logically, but you don't really understand it unless you have actually know it too, right? That's why when you have married couples, it's hilarious, right? Married couple, when, when a wife you know, starts doing her thing with the husband, the guy's like, I know why you're mad. I know. I just don't understand why you're mad. I mean, I know that you, I mean, I know it, but I don't understand it, right? But y- you know what's funny? You know what's funny, though? But when the wife goes and talks to another wife, what happens? The other wife's like, I get it. Me too. Me too. And then all of a sudden, they just bond with this love, right? And then what happens with the husbands? Husbands come and like, hey, man, is yours? Yes. Me too. Me too. Me too. I get it. It's just this bond, because I understand. I just don't. 
Like, but a single guy comes and hears that conversation and be like, uh, I guess. I mean, I get, you know, I get marriage is complicated. That's what they kind of conclude. Marriage is complicated. But you don't know it. You don't understand it until you know it, right? When, when someone's passed away and someone comes to you and they've never really felt the idea of someone, they've never really had someone pass away in their life, they're not going to get it. They're not going to get it. When you, when you had your heart broken for the first time in an epic way, you're not going to ask someone who's never even dated anyone to come and try to comfort you. Someone who's dated and actually had the heart broken. I get it. I get it. I understand. Christmas, Christmas is God's ability to say to those who have been betrayed, I understand. Christmas is God's ability to say to those who have been abandoned, scorned, taunted, I get it. Those who have been abused, I get it. Those who have known sorrow to the point of death, I understand. Those who have been falsely accused, lied about, I get it. Christmas, you have Jesus coming in the manger. Why? Why a baby? Why so weak? Why so infantile? Why? So that you would know that you have a God who understands, who says, I get it. Because you know what love is? Guys, love, love, the Christmas story tells us what love is. Love is not some sort of feeling. Love is something that's being done. Love, Christmas story tells us that love is not about walking away or leaving us alone or saying that's your mess, you deal with it. I don't understand it, I'm away from you. Love is diving into the mess. Love is chasing us. Love is going into the hell which we are at, knowing it. Love is being a part of it. Love is staying and love is enduring. The Christmas story is saying, Jesus saying, I am going to put myself there because I love you. And I want you to know that every breath you take, I understand. Every breath you take, you can look at me and I can tell you, me too. Every pain, every abuse, every hurt, every abandonment you go through, I can tell you, I get it. That's the Christmas story. That's the Christmas gift. There is no other God out there that became flesh. See, when Islam comes, I think Jesus becoming flesh, you think it's a heretic. They think it's heresy. Why would God Almighty even take on human form? That's, impo- that's just mind, that's just dumb. Why would they do that? But we as Christians say, you know why? Because my God gets it. I, I can never look at God, raise my hand and say, why? When he looks down at me and tells me, I've been there. I have been there. I know what sorrow is all about. I've been there, and I'm with you now. No other God will come that way. No other God will give us that. There's no one on this earth that understands it as much as he. Why did he choose to come this way? So that he can sympathize with us in our darkness, in our hell. But God didn't just come. He didn't just come to sympathize. He came to save. Look at 1 John. 3.16, not John 3.16, 1 John 3.16. 1 John 3.16, just as epic of a verse. 1 John 3.16. And this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, so we ought to lay down our lives for others. The Christmas story is not just God coming to take on the force of our brokenness. The Christmas story is God saying, I am willing to come to rescue. I am willing to come to dive into your hell to show you who I am. You all have a picture of what you think I am, but let me show you who I am. The wood of the manger and the wood of the cross. You know what that, you know what that connection is? The manger and the cross, it tells us that God would do anything to pursue you. He will go through any length to pursue you. That he is relentless. That God is not disappointed in you. That God is not looking at you as if you are a mess that cannot be saved. He is not looking at you and thinking that you are a lost cause. He is not looking at you and trying to baby you through anything. He is looking at you and saying, I will pursue you until you take your last breath. And I will not stop pursuing you. All right. 
Love is not when you're cleaned up. Love is not when you get your act together. Love does not happen when you think you're ready for him. Before you were even close to even being ready, he's already dived in. He's already pursued, and he's already chased. We understand this. I know, I know you're thinking, like, that's, that's pretty epic, that's pretty big, but we understand this in a very, you know, minuscule way. Imagine this, okay? Imagine my wife and my son, burning building, okay? Building's going up, okay? And then everyone's telling me, don't go in, you know? I mean, I'm going to go in, right? At least save the sun, right? At least I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> All right. You're gonna go in, right? You're gonna go in. You're gonna jump in. You're gonna save. You're gonna save your family. It doesn't matter what people say, cause you understand that they're important. They mean something. Okay. You would jump into that. You understand sacrificial love. Let's add. Let's, let's just kind of up the picture. Let's say my son, at tender age of three, he decides to rebel. He's just like, you know, I'm done with you, daddy. Right. I don't care about 10 cameras. I'm leaving you, right? And he walks away, goes to another family, okay? Building burns up. Am I going to like, oh, yeah, you left me. Forget you, bro. I'm done with you too. I have another one coming, right? (laughs) It's over, right? Am I going to say that? No. Right? If something happens, I'm going to, even if he denies me, even if he's turned his back on me, right, we would pursue. I would jump in that. And if if we, listen, as we, as me, 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 right, as a failed human being, right, if I can approximate even the faintest echo of sacrificial love, how much more do you think the God who defines it can do it? How much more do you think that the God who defines love would do it for you? If you yourself understand even just the smallest taste of sacrifice, does it not make sense that the God, hey Seth, does it God, does it not make sense that the God who defines love will understand <laughs> what sacrificial love looks like? <laughs> you're great, bro. You you ruined my moment, right? Right. So what am I saying, guys? What is Christmas? What is Christmas? Christmas is not just about gifts and it's not just about the holiday season. Christmas is not just about you know, doing these things. Chris, the beauty and the picture of Christmas. Why do we celebrate? We celebrate a God who came in the manger that tells us no matter how beaten, no matter how broken, no matter how abandoned, no matter how abused, no matter how scorned, no matter how rejected, no matter how much lied to, how much we are wrongly accused, no matter where we are, Jesus in the manger tells me, I understand. I get it. I went through it. I know. I don't just know up here. I'm not just knowing by observing. I know because I felt it. I know because I touched it. I know because I bled for it. I know because I bruised over it. I know because I felt the spit upon my face. I know because I felt the slap upon my cheek. I know because I felt the thorn in my skull. I know because I was alone in the garden. I know. And the cross, the will of the cross, what does that tell you? It tells you that you are not beyond him. That he will go to whatever length, that he will pursue you to whatever ends, that he will run after you, that you are not a lost cause, that you don't need to get your life together in order to come and face him, that he is already pursuing you to the end, that he is chasing you with his love. That's what the Christmas story is about. When we come and we see Christmas, I need you guys to see this God I need you to see this Jesus because this Jesus is why we celebrate. This Jesus is the one whom we give our hearts to. This Jesus is the one who actually understands, and this Jesus is the one who's, who actually relentlessly pursues. We all want to be pursued. We all want to be loved, but we only see it in the cross. And that's him. And that's Christmas. And that's the mystery of the ages. When we wonder to ourselves, how did he come and why did he come? He came in a way to know and to let you know forever, I get it. I get it. And he came to tell you, I will not stop. I will not stop. Until the day you take your last breath, I will not stop for you. Let's pray. So in this season, guys, 
in this time. Can we come? Whether you've known the Lord for many years or whether maybe now you're coming home or maybe you've kind of w- walked away for a while, wherever you're at in your life, would you come today and would you just say yes? You know, it's your time to just say yes to that love. Yes. Yes to him. Yes to just to saying, Lord, I know. I get it. You get me. You understand me. And I see, yes, that you will go to whatever length to have me. Yes. Yes, take this life. Take me. And may 2018, as I enter into it, may I stop may I stop walking around feeling like I'm the victim of this world. May I stop in 2018 walking around that the world is against me and no one knows. May I stop in 2018 thinking that I am beyond help. When all along the Christmas tells me you're here, you get it, and you won't stop. You won't stop. So God, yes. Can we come and we begin to pray that? Yes, Lord. Yes to you. Yes to you in my life. Yes to you taking control. Yes to you doing your work. Yes to you molding. Yes to you transforming. Yes to you (sighs) telling me, guiding me, showing me what is the path of my life. What is the best way to flourish. Yes to you. Trusting in you. Let's come. Let's just pray for that. Let's lift it up before the Lord.